fiction, science fiction, horror, fantasy, crime, LGBT, thriller. You have now entered the House of Mystery. With your hosts, Eric Shapiro, David North Martino. John Copenhaver and Al Warren. 106.5 FM Los Angeles. 102.3 FM Riverside. And 1050 AM Palm Springs. Welcome back into the House of Mystery. I'm Al Warren, Mr. Joe Goldberg here, so you know it's a spy day. We're spies, we're everywhere, we're espionage, we're thrillers. We're off, really. Yeah, you're sort of, I know you're just undercover. You're not really on the I radio. wish I was under the covers. It's, it's a busy time of year. I just want to stay under those covers and, and, and just stay, stay. Hide from the world. Hide from the world. Well, today we've got a couple of great writers. Uh, everyone should know their name. Uh, of course, Mr. Steve Barry we've had before, so welcome to the show, Steve. Thank you for having me back. Yeah, it's a pleasure always. And then Mr. Grant Blackwood. Now, we haven't had Grant on before. I've asked him, but he's, he always turns me down. So, But welcome to the show, Grant. He's a perceptive person. Yeah. Thank you for having us. That's great to hear. So your new book, The Ninth Man, and it's Luke Daniels' book one. But before we kind of get into that book, it's really interesting when I see two action, let's say, writers, suspense writers such as yourself. How did you two get... Uh, together, like Grant, how did you get involved with this character? Well, you know, I I read the last when Luke was introduced. Um, I kind of picked it up there and read the books from there, um, and so I loved Luke to begin with. But when Steve approached me with the idea of doing a Luke Daniels, um, I was thrilled, and I was even more thrilled when he wanted me to be involved. So that's kind of how it started. Did he get you into trouble? Is he like tell us tell us some secrets about Steve? Um, yeah, I'm going to get a, a talking to for this. I'm sure afterwards. Um, but Steve is one of the kindest uh, guys I've ever known, very uh, decent guy. And that kind of goes against his reputation. So, Steve, I apologize. <laughs> you're killing me, man. You're killing me. You're killing me. Yeah, come on. Tell us some real dirt here. This I was, is terrible. I was, I'll go the great lengths for that reputation. You just take it away from me. Yeah. How rude. <laughs> you key. Uh, well, Steve, Steve, where did where did it come from for you? So it, it, Luke Daniels and the, the whole concept of, of Luke, um, how did it begin for you? Well, when I went back, uh, when I switched publishers, I moved from Minotaur to Grand Central. When I moved over, they wanted, you know, three, three two Cotton Malones and a standalone from me. But I also had the concept that I wanted to do a separate series with Luke Daniels. I've been wanting to give him his own book. So I approached them with that, and they said, sure, let's do it. Well, I knew I couldn't write two in one year. It's just not possible. My my books involve too much research, too much history, too much there, and there's just there's absolutely no way I can physically do that by myself. So when I they said yes, I thought around, and I didn't really think very long. I mean, the n name came to me very quickly. I mean, Grant has been around a long time. He's been writing books a lot longer than I have. Uh, he, yeah, he's uh, old. Yeah, yeah, he's actually younger than me, but he got published before me. He got published before I made it in. And uh, he also then went to work and, and was co-writer with uh, Tom Clancy on Dead or Alive, which was a, a huge number one bestseller. He went over to Custler and did a few books with him, and then he did a, a books with the, a, book, a couple of books with Jim Rollins. So he's an experienced co-writer, and so I'm looking for a guy with credentials of who's experienced, who knows what he's doing, and, and I knew him. And he and I had always got along real well, so I called him up and said, would you be interested in helping me out? And he said, yeah. So that's how it came about. Well, Grant, tell me about how you do the collaborative process, since you've done it so much and now you're doing it with Steve. How, how does that work for you? Well, you know, first I need to, I need to correct a misapprehension here. Um, it wasn't really me helping out Steve. It was Steve helping out me because, you know, working with him yeah. has been really rewarding. I've done a lot of collaborations uh, and this has been uh, the best for a lot of reasons, not to take away anything from my my other co-authors, but this has been the best by far. One of the things I learned early on when I, I co-authored is that, you know, I kind of need to figure out the way the other person wants to do it because so far most of the, all of the authors I've worked with have been bigger names than I am in, in just terms of sales. And so my first thing was I wanted to figure out what they wanted to do, how they wanted to run it. So I'm very flexible 
Um, and I think having done, you know, three or four uh, co-authoring gigs, I was, I'd kind of uh, learned in the trenches, so I was ready to do it anyway Steve did. And luckily, we really are simpatico when it comes to not just books, but the way to work them. So it, it worked out really well. Yeah, I can I can add a little bit to that. But this particular book, I had the idea. I had the idea of what I wanted to do. I knew what I wanted the 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 historical hook to be, and that was going to be JFK's assassination. And and it's a a new take on it, a new angle on it. And I've been wanting to to use it in a novel, but it just it never quite worked for Cotton Malone. It just never fit for him very well. So I had the idea. I gave Grant the idea. Him and I then sat down. And we kind of plotted out a general way. The book would go, but as I told him, I said, we're not married to this now. We're just, we're just thinking out loud. Here's all we're doing. And then Grant wrote the first draft. He wrote the entire first draft all the way through. And then he gave it to me and then I rewrote the book. And the reason why I had to rewrite the book is because he's new to me. He doesn't know my voice. So I had to put my voice into the manuscript. Uh, and that we knew that going in, that was where it was going to be. And so I rewrote it and he went back through the rewrite. We went back and forth a couple of times and that's how we ended up with the finished manuscript. And luckily, neither one of us get married to our words. Neither one of us have great ego on one thing or the other. The object is to get a book that people are going to like. And obviously it's got to be a book that appeals to my reader base because that's what we're selling it. And Grant, as a, as a co-writer, a, a pro who knows that is, uh, is, is, is easy to work with there. That's the co-writer's job is to become the other guy, you know, basically. And, uh, and then hopefully the second book, he'll have my voice a little better. Third book, he'll have it even better. That's, that's the idea. Fingers. Two writers writing a book, it's more about the finished product than the writer itself, right? Correct, correct. Always the finished product. We, uh, we just, you can't get your ego in it. We've got to come up with this book and we've got to make it work and we got, we have a limited amount of time to make it work. So we really can't sit around and debate it. We got to, we got to go. We got to get it going, get it moving and go. And, uh, luckily, as I said, when you get a, a pro who's done it before, it's not a problem. And, and I knew that and it, it turned out it worked great. Now listen, so Steve, why JFK? Like what was it? I mean, it's, it, it's an, it's a really interesting time in the U.S. in the 60s, as well as the whole JFK presidency and then and all that. But um, it's also very conspiratorial. You know, we've done a, several interviews with everybody from Roger Stone to you name it, who's written a book about the JFK assassination, and it's still a very big question. But it, it can run the gamut of being anywhere from aliens to you know, um, body snatchers. There's so many conspiracies out there. So what was it about JFK that drew you to this? Well, one thing, I was mindful that this was the 60th anniversary. So I knew we would pick up some, some you know, built-in kind of marketing from that a little bit. So I, I, we were a little bit mindful that, you know, last year when, when, we, when I was thinking about this with Grand Central. But two, it remains a seminal event in American history. And we literally have no idea what happened. We really don't. The Warren Commission came up with the conclusion of one shooter and three bullets. There have been several extensive investigations since that time, two by Congress itself, that cast great doubt on that. Uh, there are a lot of questions. The Warren Commission itself, the Warren Report, is loaded with questions. When you read it, you'll go like, whoa, 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 wait a minute, where that, whoa, that's a big conclusion you just made there. Where did that come from? They just basically, they had, they had the outcome already in their mind. The idea was to get that out to the public so that the American public would know one guy killed Kennedy, period. No conspiracy, no nothing. And we are the Warren Commission. We know what we're talking about. We are the experts. We did it. But they did a very poor job of investigating, a very poor job. Of There's one theory that came along in 1992 from a guy who spent a lot of years working on it. And this guy was no crackpot. He was a smart fellow. And he sat down and he put something together that's very interesting. And, he, and there was a book written about it. And I read that book, and I have that book on my shelf, and I said, this is going to make a great thriller one day. And The Ninth Man is that thriller, where we take that theory that perhaps can answer all of the unanswered questions in a way that makes sense. I don't want. I know I'm being a little obtuse, but I can't give away too much. You know, we want. Can you tell us the book, Steve? Oh, book the book is it? called Mortal Error. 
Okay. The book yep. is called Mortal Error. It's a, it was published by my old publisher, Macmillan. It's a fascinating read, and it made for a great novel. It really did. And so we were able to work that all in here and bring that theory out in a way that the reader can easily comprehend it and easily understand. And um, it's, it's, I think people are going to be a little surprised, like, wow, you know? Never thought about it like that before. Yeah, well, Joe did it. Yeah. I think, actually, the Kennedy assassination is the, my first cognitive memory, I believe. I would have been just about three. I remember getting up and saying, Mom, where are the cartoons? And she said, something bad has happened. That is, that's vivid in my mind, and I believe that was the Kennedy assassination. I remember I was sitting in third grade class, and I remember them coming in and the, the nun telling everyone that the president had just been killed. I can still remember that. I was, you know, third grade was seven, eight years old. So I was eight years old. And I can remember that very vividly. Everyone who was alive at the time can remember where they were when they heard that. I was only four four months old, so it wasn't me. What's your What's your history, Grant? Like, how do you How did you feel about the the, you know the whole JFK assassination and everything when you got into the story? How was it before for you? If there is such a thing, I have some kind of a pre memory of the JFK assassination. I was actually born in Dallas in July of 64. And shortly after my mom found out she was pregnant with me, she drove down through Dealey Plaza an hour before Kennedy got there. And so, you know, there's no evidence of this, but I always find it fascinating that I've been fascinated with the Kennedy assassination. There's that proximity of of, uh, not only time and space there, but um, I think my real connection to the Kennedy assassination where I read uh, Best Evidence by David Lifton. Yes, um, great book. Great book, fascinating book. It's a, it's a beast of a book, uh, but I got through it, and I don't know I don't know if I buy his explanation. It's compelling, um, but that kind of sunk me into the world of JFK, JFK assassination, and so i always been steeped in it, and when Steve suggested it, I was thrilled. I, I like to get into the weeds on these kinds of things. And that was another great thing about working with Steve is that he kind of would pull me up from the weeds a little bit and say, that's that's too much weed stuff, so let's get out of this. But that's kind of how I got into the JFK uh, groupie mindset, for lack of a better term. Groupie. Well, well Steve, so did you have um, some sort of an idea of what you wanted to tell people in the book? I mean, because there's all the action and adventure and all the stuff going on and suspense, you know, the whodunit kind of idea. But was there something, was there a point to this? No, the number one point of any novel for me is to entertain people. So I've got to entertain them. That's the number one thing. So we had to, we came up with a story that's fun, that's interesting, that's exciting, that has elements to it and has surprises, has some, some, several surprises along the way. So we, we, we first came up with that. We needed a story to entertain. Now, along the way there, we've got to weed in, you know, weave in this theory, weave in this whole concept of all. And I never could make it work with cotton. It just didn't fit with cotton very well. But it fit perfectly here with Luke. And so we came up with a, a, a plot that, that brings it all out in a nice slow progression. And you, the reader picks up on it. And by the end, I hope the reader will go, you know, whoa, you know, that, that makes, that's, that, I never thought about that before. And it's not a grand conspiracy either. Mortal Error is not about a grand conspiracy. It's about something much more simple, much simpler, much more simpler. And, and there's an old rule, you know, the simplest explanation is usually the explanation. And so that's what we focused on. We focused on a good story. But then we had to weave in this stuff, and Grant kind of got really into it. There's some there's some uh, diagrams in the book, and he drew all those diagrams and put all that together to, to help explain some of this. Uh, if you've ever been to Dealey Plaza, I don't know if you have, but it's very small. It's very small. You know, you see the pictures of it and the videos and all, and it looks like a big place. It's really not. It's extremely small. So you can see how that could get buttoned up in there, how you could get really tight in there and, and kind of trapped almost in this area. Very interesting. Um, I think we I think we captured it. I think the reader will understand it. The question is, you know, uh, how they'll like it. Let's see how they like it. So, Steve, did you have to take any uh, liberties with history, which everybody knows every second of, uh, to, to weave your characters in? Not of, not of what happened that day, other than we added a 
fictional character. We added a fictional person to the scene because it was easier to tell it through that fictional person than to use the real people. But we used the, the, the real names of everyone who was there except for our fictional guy, of course. Uh, there. So that's the only thing we added uh, to the concept of it. And we have a writer's note in the back of the novel that will tell the reader everything that's true and false so that you'll know exactly what it is. Well, it's, it's a real interesting case. Did, did, did you kind of, after you get through a book like this, do you sort of, how do you feel about the case now? Do you feel differently? I, I think the theory in mortal error has, has some merit to it. Unfortunately, every single person associated with it is now dead. So we We'll never know. We will, there's no way. That's the thing about the Kenny says. There's no way to prove anything. Everybody's dead. All the evidence is muddled up beyond use. Um, mortal error deals with an, another aspect of it, though, that can be independently looked at. And, the, and it was. They studied it. They ran tests. They ran simulations. Uh, and that it's all explained. So it makes it, it's one of those theories that kind of makes sense, but it's so out there that you go like, nah, that can't be true. But wow, that does make a lot of sense. You know, uh, I wrote a book a few years ago called The King's Deception. It's about Queen Elizabeth I. And the concept that King Queen Elizabeth I may very well have been male. She may have been a man. She was not a woman. And I started that book thinking that was a silly notion. That was just ridiculous. When I finished the novel, I can tell you now, I'm convinced that she was. She was not. She was a man. And the, and the whole Bisley Boy legend and everything that's over there in central England makes perfect sense. So I go in these things with an open mind to see where, where it is. And this one, this one had always appealed to me. So we'll see what the readers think of it now that this may get some wider pull because the book itself, nobody really paid much attention to mortal error. Well, let me, let me hit up the process piece one more time because I, you said that you talked it over and then Grant wrote the first draft and you rewrote it to your voice. Grant, when you when you guys talked it over, then Grant, you wrote the first draft. Did you have the second and third book in mind as you were doing that? No, um, we were so focused. You know, I don't know. I can't speak for Steve, but I think we were so focused on this book and getting it right and telling an entertaining story that that was our sole focus. Um, and we went back and forth. It was a hugely collaborative process. You know, I knew Steve was going to put his stamp on it, and I I wanted that. Um, but as far as ideas, we often change things in midstream. Uh, so that was really helpful, too, to make sure that we were always heading to the same direction, right, an entertaining book. And we wanted people at the end of this, aside from being entertained, we wanted them to come away thinking, wow, this really could have happened. Um, a lot of stuff fits well here. And uh, there's a lot of really true stuff about the Warren Commission that sort of fit what we're discussing. One of the things I found fascinating is that of the 10 protective detail members that day in Dallas, the Warren Commission interviewed three of them, um, which I just find mind-boggling. So those kind of details, which are true, add to that 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 woo factor. The reader hopefully will come away and say, this could be a real thing. Yeah, and even worse than that, the, the seven they didn't interview, several of them got drunk the night before in Fort Worth. And were basically hung over when they came to work the next day. And so their own protected detail. But the Warren Commission found that had no effect on anything. It's just one sentence that literally says that. We have had no effect on anything. Well, how did it not have effect on anything? Did you interview anyone? Did you talk to anyone? Did you study? Did you look at anything? You just gave me one sentence that just said it. So these are all things that are very interesting. The Warren Commission report is basically a report that already had the answer before they wrote the report. And they just wrote the report to fit the answer. Well, I, I wasn't the, the Warren Commission was really about probably calming the nation. Correct. You know, Correct. You know, your your president's been shot and killed, and there's like a lot of a lot of fear, and there was a real communist fear back then too, right? So they were probably, in a way, had it in mind to try to calm everyone down. It was, but it, but I don't. I think misleading or. Not doing your job is not the best way to do that. Oh, no. It was back then. <laughs> yeah. Back then, I guess you could get away with that because, you know, we didn't have the Internet. We didn't have all these things. And, you know, it was before Watergate, so government was relatively trusted. You know, it was a whole different environment. I understand how it happened. I understand, you know, why it happened. But that doesn't make it correct. And now today, looking back on it, you can read that report and go, whoa, wait a minute, whoa, that's not right. No, that's not right. That's not right. That's not right. Yeah, there's a lot in there not right. And Congress eventually said that in the two investigations that they conducted. 
Stephen, when you, we talked last time, you said something which I wrote down, and I, I paraphrase it, was, but it was basically right as close to the end that you possibly can. Start as late as you can in the book. Is this book set in those days around November? No, no. Or is no. it, how, how far in advance does it go? Before no, this that? is a modern-day thriller. Everything here happens modern day. Uh, the Luke discovers all of this as he's going through the process of dealing with what's happening to his friend Jillian. And they're going through this, as they go through this process, and these, there are people trying to kill her. And why are they trying to kill her? Well, there's a reason why they're trying to kill her. And, and as that's being discovered, he's, he's finding out about all of these things from the past. So all of my thrillers are modern day thrillers that deal with something from the past. Right, You're right. They go back and forth. When, when you start a when you start a novel, you start it as close to the end as possible. And this one, we start. I don't know what is it three days? I think the whole book is three three four days tops. So we get as close to the end as. That's great advice. I, I've been living that. So thank you for that one. That's interesting. How much how much research do you, did you do with the case itself besides um, mortal mortal error? Well, we focused there because that's where the book's going to come from, but we, I, we delved into the Warren Commission report quite a bit. In fact, it's quoted in the novel in several places. We actually quote the report in the novel. So between the Warren Commission and Mortal Era, the two things we really got heavily into uh, because we were focusing on that theory and that theory alone. And we're not going – I mean, you could go on forever. You know, you're right. There's infinite amount of – conspiracy theories here but we were focusing on this one theory that is not a conspiracy theory it's just a theory of what happened that day that explains some things that no one has adequately ever explained and that's what drew me to it so grant what was your favorite part of writing this book you know i think really really digging in to and this is a bit behind the scenes but really digging into what happened that day minute by minute um getting on Google Earth and really sinking down into Dealey Plaza and thinking about what happened that day um, and then unraveling or, you know, doing dribs and drabs of, of that story as Luke uncovers him, I thought that was a lot of fun because the reader learns about the JFK assassination as we go along. And for a good portion of the book, book Luke doesn't know what this is about. And when he finally realizes that, uh, and it hits home for the reader. I thought I think that's a really impactful way of doing it. So that that dovetailing of history and plot and uh, contemporaneous action, I really loved it. Steve, Luke, where did Luke come from? How did you create that character? Well, I didn't. My wife did. <laughs> she wanted. Uh, she said, "You need a younger guy in here," you know. And I said, "Well, you know, Cotton doesn't appreciate that very much, you know." The, you know, that Cotton's an old guy, but because Cotton's basically me, it's basically my personality, and Cassiopeia Vitt, Cotton's love interest, is basically her, but she said, you need a younger guy, and so I said, okay, so after Henrik Thervalison, that character, I I kind of ended with him, and the Paris Vendetta, uh, I decided, well, okay, let's come up with it, so she came up with the, the character, she's the one that gave me all the characteristics of, he would be Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, his brothers would be Matthew, Mark, and, you know, John, he's the youngest, um, comes from t Tennessee and calls his mother every Sunday. He, she just rattled off all these things about Luke Daniels. And I said, well, this is great. I like it. Let's go. So we put it all down. And so he made his debut. And uh, he came in uh, uh, the Lincoln myth, I believe, was his debut, uh, was his first book. And um, he comes back in the Cotton series about every other book he's there. Uh, he's a younger version of Cotton, so he's a little more impetuous. He's not as experienced. He can make mistakes. He kind of jumps in a little too quick sometimes. He's not as, not as methodical as Cotton, so it's a lot of fun with him. But he's learning. He's getting better. And in this book, he grows a little bit. He gets a little more experience, a little more there. In the second book, he's going to get a little more. He gets a little more. He's growing up. He's learning to be... Cotton. He, he, he calls Cotton Pappy because he's an old guy, and Cotton calls him frat boy. You know, they, uh, they had a, a, a contentious relationship in the Lincoln myth. Uh, but then they, uh, they now get along quite well, uh, and it, it, it works out. Um, he was just in uh, The Last Kingdom, uh, Luke was, with Cotton Malone that came out earlier this year. 
And uh, now he gets to star front and center. So uh, it's, it's been a lot of fun. I, I've been wanting him to have it for a long time. It's, it's really kind of cool to see it come to life. Well, Grant, you're, you know, you're, Grant Blackwood, you're a writer of, of esteem and renown and do it for a long time, many series, many great characters. What skills, experience did you think you bring, brought best to this book? You know, I, I think I've had to write, you know, Clancy is Clancy, and everybody knows Clancy, and then there's Jim Rollins and Clap Cussler. They're all thriller authors. The, the universes are all under the thriller umbrella, but each one does something a little different. So having to adjust to that, and try to find their voice and know what audience I'm aiming for um, has been hugely instructive. And I don't, I can't point to any one thing, but each collaboration, especially with Steve, I've come away learning new things about how to do things differently. And after 35 years in the business, that's kind of refreshing to be able to realize I just learned something new that I can do better. And so from a from an inward perspective, that's a lot of fun. But I think flexibility has taught me to be very flexible Keep in mind that, you know, we're here to serve the reader um, because without the reader spending their hard-earned time and uh, and money on these books, we're just dudes sitting in a room making up stories. And so always keep in mind that entertainment is, is priority one. Well, I mean, I would say what Grant definitely brought to the table, he writes really good action scenes. This is what he does really well, uh, much better than I did. Much better than I do. He has a great way of bringing in these action scenes and taking them down. What I do a little better than he does is I can mix history with information. I can mix in the history and the information and that kind of stuff together. I have a a knack for that. So together, we both do things separately, and they came together nicely, really, really nicely, because he, I would take his action scene, and I told Grant that. I said, don't worry about all that history. Don't worry about trying to mix it in. Just get down the draft and get the action down. I'll add all that in. And it, it worked out really well. It just, it was a good mix where we're not stepping on each other's toes. Each one of us did something separate that came together nicely. And that's, you know, talking about history, one of the, my, my negative tendencies, and I think I'm better at it now, is when you're talking about history is info dumping on the reader. And it must start to go mechanical. And Steve is superb at not info dumping on the reader. And so watching that process, I've gotten better at it, but um, it's also satisfying to know that if I write really good action and I try to do a little history, he, Steve is going to be there to smooth it out, put his own stamp on it, and so uh, I don't have to worry about my dumping info on the reader. It's a little touchy sometimes when you do this kind of thing because we're writing to my audience. We're not writing to our audience. We're writing to my audience. So the book has got to sound like me. It's got to sound like me. And if it doesn't sound like me, my people aren't going to buy it. And so we have to we have to keep that in mind at all times. I would love for Grant to write the entire book. It'd be great. He sends it over to me. All I do is a little edit on it. Life's great. But that's not realistic because I have to put my voice in there. And he doesn't know my voice. He'll get it over time, but he's not going to know it the first time out of the box. No, so I was going to say, Steve, what's the, what's the secret to selecting what information and, and history you put into the book or what, what you fictionalize and what you make as, as, you know, from real evidence? Like kind of, is there a secret to this? Well, not a secret, but experience teaches you. And if you go back and read some of my earlier novels, The Amber Room, The Romanoff Prophecy, Third Secret, You'll see how I mixed information in action there was not quite as smooth as I do it today. It's a little smoother, and I'm not saying I'm great at it by any means. I'm just saying I'm better at it than I was then. And you can see how I did it a little, how I did it then and how I do it now. It's just a, an instinctive thing I've learned because my readers want that information. I can't leave that out. I can't just ignore that. That wouldn't be a Steve Berry book. That would be a, someone else's book. So I've got to put it in there. The question is, I've got to get it in there where the reader doesn't realize that I just told you something. That's the trick, that you, you're reading along and you go, oh, man, I just learned something. Well, wow. they didn't even realize it. And just keep going and just keep going. That's the trick. If, if the reader realizes that I'm telling you something, then it becomes that info dump. And I work hard, try not to do them. I don't, you know, I'm sure there's some in there, and I'm sure people would say some of these are there, but we try as hard as we can 
My wife's my first reader. She's an editor herself, and she is really hard on me on that. So she's tough. She does not allow us. She does not allow info dumps, and so she's pretty tough on them. So we we're, we're careful as we can. But my books have to have that information. They just they have to be in there. And and I added it, I added a good bit into this book because I told Grant I said don't worry about that. I mean you can't worry about that. Just give me the story, get it down, and then we'll we'll go from there. Yeah, yeah, it's important. And and Grant, so how do you write an action scene? I I I, I need advice here. So, no, uh, no, I just, think, pen is up. Let's go. Yeah, I know. On, but yeah. how is what's what's key in an action scene for you? Like, what do you think is the uh, most important elements? Well, I think you know. Again, going back to the entertainment value, I, I think one of the most important things is is get that authentic feel. And that only comes through experience and, and reading a lot. And you've got to kind of gauge that authenticity on the genre you're doing, whether it's more high concept or nitty gritty. Um, but learning a lot about how action unfolds in the real world, um, writing it badly for a while and then writing it well, and not getting bogged down in nomenclature and things like that about bullets and how fast they're traveling and why you might punch somebody this way. Um, but from a technical standpoint, I think the deeper you get into action, you know, once you, if you, you know, use choppier sentence, short declarative fragments, and a lot of introspection from the people involved in the action, it gets down to this really nitty gritty, I feel like I'm in this person's body going through it. And I think also less is more. Um, you can overwrite action to a great degree, just like you can write, overwrite anything, but keeping in mind that readers are smart. Uh, readers are savvy. If you give them just enough to get a feel for what's happening in the action, their imaginations will work the rest. So, like Steve said with history, it's just practice over time. Um, but thinking in terms of actions unfolding, it's fast, it's choppy, and it's moving, try to emulate that on the page is one of the things that is important to me. So do you stay away from getting into too much detail about the the, the type of gun used and 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 explaining all of that, do you kind of stay away from that? Um, you know, I, again, it depends on the genre, but this book, I thought, some some bit of nomenclature about the kind of weapons being used without getting too bogged down into, you know, magazine size and all that, I think that was important. One, because I think that lends to authenticity, but two, Luke Daniels is a former ranger, and this is what these guys do all day, every day. And so we had to portray Luke as a guy that knows the stuff inside out and tried to do that. And Rangers are not just known for their familiarity with this stuff, but their attitude that they take into combat. And so we we're kind of hoping to lend authenticity in that way as well, because they think differently than other soldiers. And so we wanted to put that on the page, too. So you went out in the bush and pretended to be a ranger for a couple of weeks? Well, I mean, my ma, my my wife sent me in the backyard with a tent. I don't know <laughs> yeah, if that you counts. Find those rabbits. Spend some time out there. So keep the rabbits out of the garden. That's right. That's right. So Steve, I'll go with you on this one. Um, you have you have Luke. You had the idea that you've had from the back of your mind for a long time about the JFK thing. What came first as you're putting it together? The JFK plot or what you wanted Luke to become and do during this book, have him grow as a character? Both. They came simultaneously because I knew that I wanted the book to be about the, the, the JFK assassination. But first off, because it's just interesting. Second off, it's kind of like catnip to thriller readers in a lot of ways. Uh, so it, it, it provided a good hook to bring people in to the book. And then, you know, the whole purpose of the book was to develop Luke as a, as a, as a more full-fledged character and a little more three-dimensional, a little more into his personality. You learn a lot about Luke's personality in this novel. He, there's some great surprises he has to deal with, some things, he, there's a lot of things he's got to deal with that, uh, he never, uh, I don't, when the book, when the story starts, he never anticipates where this is going, uh, at all. It, uh, what where it ultimately goes is a great surprise for both Luke, Luke and the reader because we don't foreshadow any of it. <laughs> we give you no foreshadowing of it whatsoever. I'm on, it's going to be really funny with, when it, you read the Amazon reviews when people say, well, I saw that coming a mile away. <laughs> There's no way because neither one of us saw it coming until we got to the very end. So we never uh, we never foreshadowed anything. We never gave any foreshadowing. We never gave any anticipation. We never laid, laid anything for it. We just, 
it just naturally progressed into that area. So uh, it's, it was fun for Luke to grow. He needs to grow. I want him to grow as a character. We're working on the second book right now, and he's grown a lot in that book. Even in the second book, he, uh, he gets himself involved in something very, very treacherous, and he handles it like a pro. He's becoming a pro now. He's becoming really good at what he does. Not to say that he can't still be a little impetuous, though, and do some wild stuff. With your character, Luke, then are you going to select a lot of historical events and tie it in with him? Again, or are you just or are you going in a different direction? Well, the object, what we wanted the Luke Daniels books to be was to be a little more action adventure, uh, a little history, but more action adventure, and that's where we that's where we are. And there is that that's the way this book is. This book is action adventure with some history in it. Where Cotton Malone is is a is a is a is a mixture of both, a clear mixture of both. So we wanted these to be a tad different. They wanted maybe a little more Custler-esque, if I wanted to say, if I had the same thing, a little more like Clive would do uh, with his series. And, and I think it turned out that way. The second book definitely is that way. There's a lot of action adventure in the second book, a whole bunch. And so we want, we want that. But there's, a, there's, a, there's a cool history thing, too. And there will be a, you know, one in the third book as well, something very cool in that as well. We want that, that what I call the ooh factor, the thing you look at and kind of go, ooh, that's pretty cool. Ooh, like JFK assassination. Okay, ooh, that's cool. I mean, that, that's something interesting. You want that ooh factor. So we're very much going to have that. But the books will be more action adventure, a little more than Cotton is used to. I take notes. I'm trying to figure out how to, how to write ooh in my notes. Um, <laughs> you need so, ooh factor. Ooh factor is important. <laughs> yeah. Grant, how did you uh, work in your own writing in this process? Or did you just drop everything to do this book? Were you, were you multitasking? Well, you know, I, I've been working on a standalone for quite a while. It had been on the back burner. Uh, and so when Steve came calling, I didn't have anything pressing. I wasn't under contract. Um, and so I, you know, I thought about it for, you know, he made the offer, and I must have thought about it for a quarter second, I think, and then I leapt, and we got into it. So I didn't have anything hanging over my head, so I was I was happy to happy to get into it. Quarter of a second, you're supposed to play hard to get. Yeah, I'm, I I almost went ooh. Yeah, I'm not a good poker player. I, so. made, I, I made him an offer he couldn't refuse. <laughs> Let me write that down. He goes slower, coach. Offer he couldn't refuse. Offer he couldn't yeah. refuse. <laughs> Wow. So, so, Grant, when you do a Clancy novel, does it? Um, it must be a totally different experience when you're when you're trying to fill the shoes, and so to speak. How how is that for you? Like, how do you handle that? Well, you know, one of the one of the oddities about Clancy, and I guess he shares this with probably Michener and a couple others, but the bigger the Clancy book, the better it sells. And so, going into it, I knew that was the deal. The readers wanted that. And my role in, the, in Dead or Alive was actually fairly minor. I mean, the book was there, the characters were there. I just did some housekeeping and rewriting and, and brought it together. Uh, but I had to learn to be a bit long-winded. And that's not to say anything as Mr. Clancy, but that's his style and that's what his readers want. And so I had to kind of let loose on my natural, my natural economy with description and, and, and narrative and things like this. So that was a big change, uh, but, you know, I'd read Clancy since, I actually read Hunt for October while I was in the Navy aboard an anti-submarine uh, frigate, and so that was an interesting thing. I was reading things that I was doing that he was writing about. So I've been a Clancy fan forever, and so I, I was steeped in it. I got into the book, and um, it was a fairly easy transition, aside from letting myself off the leash. And we had that, we had that talk. A little bit of that talk, because I, I told him, I said, you know, one of the rules of writing is shorter is always better. So we're not writing Clancy. We're not writing Clancy. We're going we're gonna to write short and tight. Like, like my readers would not, would want it just the opposite. They want it short and tight. So you, you, you have to tailor it. That's the great thing about Grant. He knows how to tailor it to the particular audience. That's the whole idea. But, but did, did you feel a great deal of pressure with that, you know, under writing under that name? You know, here's an inside secret is that, and I think this is actually a credit to Mr. Clancy. My name was not originally going to be on that book. Um, and then they went to Mr. Clancy and, and told him that. He said, oh, no, his name needs to be on it. So that it felt like bigger shoes at that point because though I was proud of the book, I was now also a part, partially a face on it. So I felt a big responsibility, but the book did 
wonderfully. I mean, it was his first book in seven years, and it spent, I think, three or four weeks at number one and at Christmas. And so we were all very pleased that for him as a comeback, that was a good thing. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Okay. So now, um, what's next for both of you guys um, after The Ninth Man comes out? So let's start with Steve. Well, I have uh, the next Cop Malone book will come uh, February 20th of next year. It's called The Atlas Maneuver. It's a really cool book dealing with uh, something that I knew nothing about, but I've learned a lot about, Bitcoin. It deals with that, but it also deals with something very interesting from history, uh, a lost treasure that I think the readers are going to really enjoy getting to know a lot more about. After that, there'll be another Luke Daniels book next summer, uh, and uh, it will be coming out then. It's called Red Star Falling. Uh, that's about all I can tell you about it. I can't tell you about the plot or anything. We kind of keep that under wraps till we get it all finished, but we're getting there now. And then there'll be a... Um, Another Cop Malone uh, in the spring of 25, and then another Luke Daniels in the summer of 25. And so that's that's what I'll be working on for the next two, three years. And what about you, Grant? Um, you know, I think in the near term, I just want to, I'm going to focus on getting book two put away, which we're close to doing now, um, get started and finish book three. And then, you know, depending on where we go with Luke Daniels, uh, I think I'm going to go back to my first standalone uh, series with a new character uh, and try and get the first draft of that wrapped out and maybe uh, cross fingers by the end of the year, have it uh, have it out with my agent and see what happens. Steve when, and, and Grant, but Steve particularly since you were just listening to your, your books, are there things when you're going through your research, because you are a researcher, that you say, nah, I don't want to cover that topic. You know, your your guys' number one thing is entertainment. It's got to be entertaining. So you say, no, this topic just isn't entertaining. Do, do, oh, yeah. Okay. What, are those, what are those things for you? Oh, it's hard. I mean, hard to say. I mean, you know, you just – I just, I, I, there are stories that just don't have – you know, it, it's interesting, um, but you just can't go into it. You can't deal with it. You can't – you know, there's things – you know, I, I don't deal with terrorism very much. I think the world's – we hear enough about it, and so in my books, there's really no terrorists. I don't deal with Middle Eastern terrorist states or Middle Eastern countries doing stuff. I, I don't go there. I don't go on any of that stuff. I don't. I don't. I don't know why I don't care for it. It's just it's too much. We hear about it too much. It's too stereotypical, and I don't like to deal. I don't deal with it. So I stay away from that. I don't do anything with uh, COVID. There's no COVID in Cotton's world. It never happened. I think people have had enough of that. I think it's depressing, and I don't think anyone wants to read about it. So, uh, so I there those are those are kind of topics I don't go near whatsoever. I just sort of stay away from. I don't have a lot of death in my books. I don't kill a lot of people. Now, Grant can. I will say now he will shoot some people. <laughs> a few. He's killed a few off. Now he will fictionally. He'll, fictionally, he'll start knocking them off, and I have been known to take some of those deaths out of there. You know. <laughs> yeah. He does have them pull the trigger, so I, I don't have a lot of killing in my books. Now, there is some, but it's necessary. It has to happen, but not just wholesale killing or whatever. Uh, I try to stay away from that, too. There's little, there's violence, but not horrible amount of violence in there. It's one reason I don't sell well in Germany. They love their, their thrillers a little grittier. But another reason why I sell very well in France, because they don't like their thrillers that way. So, you know, it, it depends on uh, the country. So these are things I am sort of mindful of, and I kind of keep an eye on. Well, wow, there you go. Well, fantastic. So let's let's talk about contact information and, and social media. Uh, Steve, what have you got up for social media and website? Well, we're on, we're on Facebook. There's a Facebook fan page, so you can go there, keep up with all of our stuff. And then I have a website, steveberry.org. It has all the books, has everything. Our tour, We're doing a few events together, Grant and I are doing. We're doing three events together for the book. We'll be at Poison Pen virtually on the 26th. We'll be in Orlando on the 28th, and we'll be in Vero Beach on the 29th. So uh, those two will be live events. So that's, those are things we will be doing in the coming 30 days. Fantastic. And, Grant, do you have a website or social media as well? I do, uh, grantblackwood.com, and I have, for whatever reason, Facebook doesn't allow me to have one page, so I have a friends page and fan page on Facebook, uh, and we're keeping people updated on uh, as we're getting closer and closer to pub date, so they can reach me there. Well, there you go. Of course, now the, the new book comes out June 27th, which happens to be my birthday. I'll be turning 
30. Happy and, birthday. <laughs> and historical fiction. <laughs> okay, maybe a little older than 30. But anyway, the, the book is called The Ninth Man. It's Luke Daniels book one. And, of course, the author Steve Berry and Grant Blackwood. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having us. Thank you very much. It's been great. Thanks, gentlemen. You've been listening to the House of Mystery radio show. To find out more about our guests, hosts, or shows, go to www.houseofmystery.com. Show's over for now. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Yeah. Good night. This is the introduction of something weird media. I'll be back.